So, um, have we grown too comfortable having the privilege of access to structured social media data that only now, when access is revoked, do we begin thinking about the implications this lost access might have on social media research? Today I'll argue that post-API research is not a mere solution to platform lockout. Instead, it requires rethinking the role of researchers in making data public again and in questioning the types of knowledge that can be gained using the data that platforms make publicly available. As we all know, in recent years, data extraction was a popular modus operandi in social media research. Platforms application programming interfaces allowed the extraction of large volumes of data, which were then analyzed using various computational, quantitative, and qualitative methods to answer a broad set of research questions on the political, societal, economic, and technological aspects of datafication. I, too, uh, used Facebook API data for various research purposes, including the monitoring of hate speech and political discourse on the platform. But as, as time went by, the allure of the ability to access large quantities of data from public Facebook pages has somewhat faded. The more I used it, the less analytical value I found in the data. Counting comments and likes seemed meaningless and unreliable. And with AstroTurf campaigns and other content manipulation, one could not really take API data at face value. The shallow analytical value of API data struck me when I attempted to cross some of the analytical boundaries of what API data allows. The graph API structures data around discrete pages and posts. It does not allow examining issues or publics across pages. It does not allow asking critical questions that we were used to asking before the API research era. This, for example, is as far as I could get with my technical abilities and skills. I attempted to characterize a national political conversation from comments to all Israeli politicians <coughs> on Facebook. Essentially, I was trying to do what digital methods were used to doing for over a decade, demarcate an issue and find its publics. I collected a lot of data, organized it by users rather than pages, and ran a clustering algorithm. The results indicated what seems like either a massive AstroTurf campaign or the existence of two legitimate publics. One engages in a vibrant political conversation across pages. That's the majority of the users concentrated around what looks like a, a, vol a colorful volcano uh, over there. And another public constituting 35% of the users that commented only on Benjamin Netanyahu's page in English. And this is the cluster that looks like a sun or a set of uh, uh, planets orbiting that uh, volcano. So what were these people saying? They were saying, God bless you, Mr. Prime Minister. Is this legitimate mobilization of ev evangelical love? Is this perhaps indication of foreign interference in shaping public opinion? API data, with all its usefulness and with its ability to extract a lot of data, is not designed to ask these kind of questions. Do we have to do forensic work before engaging in social media research? In 2017, this was my first post-API moment. Then this modus operandi had to change after Facebook, in response to misuse of users' data as part of the Cambridge Analytical scandal, shut down hundreds of thousands of applications that used API data to extract both public and personal data, including the majority of tools used by the research community. The revoked access to data extraction sparked methodological debates as researchers were trying to find alternatives for studying massively datafied algorithmic and computational platforms without the convenience and totality afforded by APIs. Among the methods that have been proposed to address what is now called post-API research are collaboration with external companies, web scraping, albeit violating a platform's terms of use, or returning to the digital fieldwork to think of new methods. I'd like to contribute to this debate by suggesting archival theory as a framework for post-API research, and by introducing counter-archiving as a method of dissent to platforms' appropriation of public data after datafication. On its face, archival thinking is unfitting for studying algorithmic media. 
while archives are static and permanent, social media are dynamic, algorithmic, and generative. The archive fever, which inflicted the humanities and social sciences in recent years, was replaced by an uncritical data fever. Why bother with appraisal, description, and ordering when the data can answer any question? The justification for applying archival thinking as a framework for studying Facebook and other data-driven companies is that these companies meticulously collect user data at unprecedented scale, thereby forming new forms of commercial archives documenting every aspect of human life. Kuldry and Mejias proposed the notion of data colonialism to describe the monopolization of data collection as a new form of capitalism. They draw parallels between Western colonial powers' appropriation of natural resources in past centuries and the contemporary datafication and com commodification of everyday life by digital platforms. Following Kuldry and Mejias, I, I, I argue that data colonialism is not only manifested in the datafication of personal and social behavior, but also in the monopolization of the public records. Although the argument may apply to other social media, my talk focuses on Facebook and draws further parallels between colonial archives and social media platforms to argue that by negotiating varying levels of access to their data and by monopolizing their power to discern between private and public records, Facebook dialectically functions as a new archon, guardian of the archive, all the while being unarchivable by design. I subsequently proposed counter-archiving as a post-API method for studying Facebook. Counter-archiving has previously been conceived as a form of epistemic re resistance that questions colonial archives' hegemonic order and that calls to understand them as sites of knowledge production rather than knowledge retrieval. Therefore, in the context of data colonialism, it is proposed to counter-archive Facebook in order to provide alternatives to the platform's appropriation of public records and to critique the epistemic affordances of the data it makes available as public. Derrida traces the origins of the archive in the archaeon of Greek antiquity and refers to it primarily as a space of privilege commanded by archons, superior magistrates acting as guardians of documents. These archives gain their ability to represent the law by being situated at the intersection between private and public spaces. The documents were signed and stored at the private households of the archons on account of the public recognition of their authority. Derrida's emphasis on the origin of the archive is thus on archive as place. I quote, the dwelling, this place where they dwell permanently, marks its institutional passage from the private to the public, which does not always mean from the secret to the non-secret. With such a status, the documents are kept by virtue of privileged topology. They inhabit this unusual place, this place of election, where law and singularity intersect in privilege." End quote. In providing a post-colonial critique of the concept of the archive, Ariela Azulay argues that Derrida's emphasis of archive as place downplays the archon's power. For Azulay, the archon's role is not only realized as the guardian of documents in his domicile, but also as the one in charge of, quote, distancing those who wishing to enter the archive too early before the material stores within would become history, dead matter, the past, end quote. Both Derrida's etymology of the archive as a public slash private place of privilege and Azulay's understanding of the archon's role in distancing citizens from information that may be of political relevance in real time are useful frameworks for understanding Facebook as self-appointed archon in the context of data colonialism and API lockouts. In the following, I'll try to justify the argument by contextualizing Facebook in wider discussions on web archiving. Arguably, API access to social media data has conflated the notion of data extraction and collection making with archiving and preservation. As Venturini and Rogers argue, 
API-based research offers methodological comfort in providing researchers with structured data, a clear demarcation of the types of data that can be extracted, their volume, and with restrictions on their use, which are specified in the platform's terms of use. Although previous research proposed using API for archiving social media, the majority of social media researchers have used API data for immediate analysis rather than for long-term preservation, appraisal of sources, or lending access to others. However, web archiving differs from, di from data extraction in the sense that it is less concerned with how the data will be used now and more with how to preserve data for access and use in the future. From as early as 1996, the Internet Archive and national libraries around the world have been preserving petabytes of archived websites and continue to do so on a daily basis. Web archiving methods were developed to fight web decay, operating under the premise that the web constitutes an important part of humanity's public record and that there is eminent need in its preservation for posterity. To web archivists and internet historians, post-API debates are not new. After nearly two decades of archiving large proportions of the open web, these practitioners and scholars were early to notice that social media platforms, especially Facebook, are unarchivable. Due to the conditions specified in platforms terms of use, social media data are no longer in the public domain and the application of web archiving software and methods that are in use to archive the rest of the web um, is both um, legally and technically impossible. To address the unarchivability of social media, web archivists began seeking post-API workarounds years before Facebook's API lockout. The solutions that have been proposed resemble the methodological solutions to post-API research that I mentioned before, and includes attempt to reach collaborative agreement between the platform and the memory institutions, the use of third-party services, and crowdsourcing. Most of these solutions either failed or have at best registered partial success. The most notorious um, uh, example uh, is the initiative to archive um, Twitter at uh, the Library of Congress. In 2010, the library had reached an agreement with a social media company to archive every public tweet posted since 2006. The collected tweets were meant to be made available for viewing after a two-year embargo. After several years of data collection, the initiative did not bear fruit, primarily since the library was unable to find solutions to the copyright and privacy challenges involved in republishing the data. Other creative examples include the National Library of New Zealand's initiative to create a time capsule of Facebook by asking citizens to donate their data. Or the Internet Archive's use of the fictive Facebook account Charlie Archivist to archive logged in Facebook pages of public figures. This account, as you can see, has zero friends, thereby ensuring that users' private data will not be compromised during the capture. But as you can see from the vast emptiness in this capture of the official page of Donald Trump, web archiving crawlers cannot fully capture the dynamic content of social media, and the eventual capture is rather incomplete. Although some of us had access to Trump's page data through the Graph API, this is the front end of our public record. This is what historians will have to work with in the future when searching for primary sources to study Trump's presidency in 2016. Such creative workarounds reflect institutional archives' attempts to reclaim their role as archons in light of growing commercialization of data that hitherto was considered public. But as memory institutions were losing grip on access to public data, Facebook started lending access to new types of archives. Parallel to the API lockout in 2018, Facebook launched what it termed the Ad Archive API, a search interface and API to access a collection of political ads in the United States and promoted it as a transparency tool that would help research manipulation. Researchers were quick to note, however, that these collections are heavily edited and appraised for reputation management. And as they exclude information about the targeting categories used to reach individual Facebook users. A few months later, the ad archive was rebranded as the ad library, and more countries were added to the service. Access to the ads was limited to seven years. 
Arguably, this is neither an archive nor a library, but another API. It allows asking limited questions. Who paid for the ad? How long did it run? How much did it cost? How many people saw it, more men than women? Uh, and in which areas? This, the answer to these questions are rough aggregate estimates. We have to trust Facebook that these figures are indicative. In calling it an archive or a library, Facebook attempts to appropriate the credibility and accountability of public memory institutions. Only again, as you can see, ads may disappear and then return to the collection without notice or reference. Parallel to the launch of the ad archive slash library, Facebook quietly blocked browser add-ons developed by civic initiatives such as the American news organizations ProPublica and the British NGO Who Targets Me. Facebook users who installed the add-ons gave permission to these initiatives to automatically and anonymously collect the political ads that were being served on the platform, along with the targeting information attached to each ad's why am I seeing this feature. The collected data were then made available to the public through a search interface. And even the collaboration with Social Science One, which Richard mentioned before, the company that was contracted by Facebook to allow supervised data access to selected researchers after the API lockout, is in doubt as the researchers never got the data. So to summarize this section, while Facebook brands itself as a benevolent archive that lends immediate access to contemporary data in the name of transparency, it also keeps away citizens from accessing information that may cause political scandal, for example, by excluded, excluding targeting information, shutting down researchers' access to its API, setting a time limit to the availability of records, and blocking browser extensions. It ensures its monopoly on record keeping. The domicilization of records is almost absolute, and researchers, journalists, activists, and citizens who come knocking at the doors of the Arkans' dwelling are not allowed to enter. If we are to accept that Facebook functions as one of the Arkans of data colonialism, then post-API research methods may also borrow from methods of resistance to colonial power. And Stoller's work on archiving as the census is a case in point. In imagining what a Palestinian archive would or ought to be, she argues that, quote, at issue is an archival assembly that is not constrained by the command in form and content that is dictated by the colonial state priorities or even by Palestinian authorities. It is rather one that is authored and is authorized by a constituent yet as unspecified Palestinian public. Stoller further conceptualizes the counter-archive as anticipating possible uses and possible connections, <clears throat> and as an invitation to make it possible to actualize connectivity that are dimly visible or on the horizon, end quote. Also in the writing in the context of Palestinian archiving, Ariel Azulay argues that archive fever, Derrida's notions of the obsession with archives and archiving described above, is itself a method of dissent. For her, archive fever is partaking in the practice of the archive through founding archives of new sorts, such as do not enable the dominant type of archive founded by the states to go on determining what the archive is. Archive fever challenges traditional protocol by which official archives are functions and continue to do so. It proposes new models of sharing the documents stored therein in ways that requires one to think the public's right to the archive, not as external to the archive, but rather as an essential part of it, of its character of, or of its raison d'etre. Following Stoller and Azulay, I propose building archives of Facebook that are designed to counter the platform's protocol of access to knowledge, that allow anticipating possible invisible connections, and that questions the public's right to the social media archive. A vivid example to what a counter-archive is and what it does is the digital archive at the Palestine Museum in Ramallah. 
these collections of posters put together statements by Israeli officials made immediately after the occupation of the Palestinian territories in 1967, next to photographs of Palestinians that counter the logic of these very statements. In this case, the statement of former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations on the morality of the Israeli occupation versus the treatment of Palestinian women by Israeli soldiers. And here, a color poster showing Israeli soldiers painting signs with spray paint on the stores of Arabs to be confiscated by the Israeli occupation next to a statement on the benevolence and neighborliness of Israel towards Palestinians. In a similar way, and moving fast, from 1967 to Facebook, counter-archiving Facebook is a call for action in as much as it is a methodological solution to platform lockout. It blurs boundaries between archiving as action and a scholarly method, between the archive as a research and object of study, and between the researchers, ar archivists, scholar, and activist. Although these blurred boundaries are intentional, they require justification. How does one distinguish between archiving as a profession, an activist counterpractice, and a scholarly method? According to the Society of American Archivists, an archivist is an individual responsible of appraising, acquiring, arranging, describing, preserving, and providing access to records of enduring value according to the principle of, principles of provenance, original order, and collective control to protect the materials, authenticity and context, and of management and oversight of archival repository or of records of enduring value. Nothing will insult an archivist more than mistaking her for being just a librarian. As can be seen, the Society of American Archivists makes the, prof makes the professional distinction very explicit on its website. Researchers are certainly not archivists. Their scholarly work may involve consulting archives or engaging in source critique, but they are not expected to acquire, appraise, order, describe, and lend access to data. Why then consider counter-archiving Facebook as a scholarly method? The call to counter-archive Facebook explicitly proposes to collect, rearrange, and republish Facebook data to go against Facebook archival order. It differs from other methods for data mining and public data sharing or dumping in the sense that it does not simply make data sets available, but rather consciously and agonistically incorporates appraisal facilitates use and is transparent about its definition of publicness and provenance. I also distinguish it from other critical social media research methods such as scraping, monitoring, repurposing, and tinkering. Counter-archiving may borrow from all of the above, yet instead of immediate use, its analytical value is in reclaiming the parts of social data that may be regarded as public which Facebook as Arkan decided to keep away from public scrutiny. For this reason, contrary to the logic of digital methods that unobtrusively follow the medium, counter-archiving is obtrusive as it remediates and republishes public Facebook data in ways that extend their epistemic capacities and reveal more than the platform had intended. Counter-archiving Facebook is not strictly a post-API method. It is possible to build counter-archives using API data. However, the implication of collection making post-API access is that prospective counter-archives will neither be structured nor exhaustive. Data collection might become cumbersome and manual. There will be errors. These counter-archives will inevitably be, inevitably be incomplete. They will lack researchers' ability to ground truth claims on the scale or representativeness of what they had collected. Counter-archives of Facebook are also demanding as they are not designed to meet a predefined analytical use. As Stoller noted, quote, it matters less what we do than how we do it. For in the end, we task ourselves to thicken the present with such alternatives. It is those who contribute to this archive in the making who have it in their collective hands to forge an archive not of the past, but of the vibrant present, saddled with the possibilities for the future. 
Hence, the analytical value of counter archives of Facebook would be found less in their content and more in the epistemic alternatives that they propose. The possibility to ask questions other than the platform had intended, the ability to imagine alternative audiences, alternative histories, and alternative analytical possibilities that could perhaps do better service to the mediation of public debates and public facts. Counter-archiving of Facebook should be built ethically and responsibly. The republishing of Facebook data should only focus on materials that are of public interest, for example, publicly funded pages of politicians, sponsored ads of medical institutions, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, it should take strict measures to exclude information that can be regarded as private. An archive that breaches users' privacy could not be counted as a counter-archive, for it will reenact the logic of that which it aims to counter. Instead, the boundaries and mission statements of each collection should be demarcated, transparent, and justified. As public-facing collections, responsible counter-archives of Facebook should be lawful and should not violate the platform's terms of use. To illustrate the manifold shapes and forms that counter-archives of Facebook could wear, I'd like to show you now two examples to public archives of Facebook data that I created before and after the platform's API lockout. The first example is Polybook, combination of politics and Facebook. A public archive of the Israeli parliament on Facebook in the years 2015 and 2019 demarcated as a longitudinal issue space. The second is Meturgatim, which is Hebrew for targeted, a crowdsourced archive of screenshots of political ads collected during the two rounds of the Israeli general election in 2019. Polybook is an archive containing every Facebook post of every Israeli parliament member during the 20th Knesset, that is between March 2015 and March 2019. Israel had two uh, election rounds since then uh, with no results and uh, we're expecting a third round of election in this March. During these years, data was extracted daily using Facebook's graph API. New posts were automatically added to an accumulative index. The archive's public search interface uses a TF-IDF ranking algorithm, which I hope you can see. Yes. So uh, it uses a, a TF-IDF ranking algorithm to assign a relative and comparative rel relevance score to each politician. That is, instead of calculating frequencies, the algorithm weighs the keyword's relevance in relation to both the politician's past posts as well as compared to all other politicians. After the user selects the time period of interest and in the search query, the results are visualized as a star hub network displaying politicians with higher relevance scores as closer to the search term than others. Coalition and opposition members are marked in blue and green, respectively, and upon clicking on the profile images, the post text are displayed along with the relevant score. In putting Facebook pages of parliament members in a public issue space populated by actors from all political camps, Facebook Polybook breaks away from Facebook's constraints on personalized newsfeed algorithms, personalized search, and from the API's affordances that limit data extraction to individual pages. Deep personalized search allows imagining new connections that Facebook's affordances do not make visible. It affords comparative and longitudinal analysis of the framing of political debates and the formation of coalitions of actors around specific issues. For example, Polybook's data shows that with the exception of three men, only women discuss gender-related issues such as sexual harassment or parenting leave. Politicians from both left and right refrain from using the term occupation in the context of Palestinians, and right-wing politicians consistently refer to asylum seek seekers as infiltrators. As an archive, it is perhaps the most complete public evidence of the role Facebook had played in mediating Israeli politics in the studied years. Yet Polybook's complete, completeness was derived from access to Facebook's graph API, which was discontinued in June 2019. The second example is Metul Gatim, 
meaning targeted in Hebrew. A screenshots archive of political advertising during the two 2019 election rounds in Israel. This archive is a response to the platform's framing of transparency with regards to political advertising during election campaigns. Ahead of the Israeli elections in 2018, Facebook announced the launch of the local version of its ad library in the country and framed it as a transparency tool. Since Facebook had blocked um, initiatives that monitor political advertising through browser extensions, we decided to build a crowdsourced archive of screenshots of political ads sent by anonymous users. Compared to methods of data extraction, the rather primitive screenshot offers limited analytical possibilities and is difficult to collect. However, the archive is centered around the screenshot due to its agonistic qualities as an object of photographic witnessing and as a digital gesture of cultural resistance. The screenshot represents users' agency to publicly and legally share data that is only made visible to them individually in ways that Facebook cannot yet control. In this case, data is manually extracted from Facebook as images, but the information the images bear is then retransformed into searchable textual data. In February 2019, two months before the first round of the Israeli elections, we issued public calls through various news outlets and asked Facebook users to send us screenshots of political ads they were served, along with a second screen screenshot of the Why Am I Seeing ad, this ad feature that each user is served individually. The screenshots were then transformed into a searchable archive using a two-step process. Uh, the first is deplatformization and perhaps replatformization. Images were manually cropped to remove end user data. Each pair of screenshots was tweeted in real time by the project's account, along with a verbal transcription of the content of the Why Am I Seeing This Ad screenshot. The republishing of the screenshots taken from Facebook on another social media platform was done in order to make them immediately available for public scrutiny, as well as to preserve them outside of Facebook. The second step was redatification. So each tweet was subsequently automatically, automatically indexed into a search engine, which allows retrieving the ads based on the trans transcribes targeting information. So this is just a beta uh, version of the search interface, which um, will launch immediately after the election in March. Overall, we collected about 3,000 political ads contributed by over 100 users. The data are by all means partial, non-representative, and hence of limited quantitative analytical value. However, in providing additional evidence that cannot be inferred from the official ad library, this archive may serve various analytical purposes, such as studying the imagined audiences and campaign strategies of political advertisers, the types of advertising categories that Facebook makes available for political use, or inferring why certain issue ads are marked as political while others are not. For example, initial analysis of the ads served ahead of the uh, September elections shows that over 35% of the collected ads were not marked by the platform as political. These unmarked ads were targeted primarily by politicians, anonymous pages, and NGOs. Ads run by pages whose administrators are anonymous are of special importance for studying manipulation or disinformation campaigns. However, since they are not marked as political, they will not appear in Facebook's official ad library, therefore doubting the very utility of making truth claims on the completeness of Facebook's official collection. We also archive conversations on political chatbots, another type of targeted propaganda which will uh, never appear on Facebook's uh, ad library. And then uh, something unexpected happened, which illustrates Ariela Azulay's point on the importance of having real-time access to public data before they are dead matter the past. I don't have enough time to go into all the details of Netanyahu's chatbot activity on Facebook Messenger and why it was both innovative and problematic in terms of micro-targeting citizens. But the short version of the story is that two days before the last election in September, I documented a poll sent through Netanyahu's chatbot on Messenger, which was only targeted to his supporters. 
Publishing polls at this time before the election is forbidden according to the Israeli election law. This was the second violation of the law by the chatbot in a week. As compared to the three years of API data that I show you at the beginning of the talk, the analysis of 5.3 million comments and 750,000 users that indicated possible manipulation but lacked evidence thereof with this miserable single screenshot, this photographic evidence, I decided to appeal to the Central Elections Committee against Netanyahu and Facebook with a request to remove the poll to ensure that further violations will not endanger the integrity of the election. And to my great, great surprise, we won. The violation of the law was clear. The Central Election Committee had ordered Facebook to either remove the illegal poll or, if this is impossible, to suspend Netanyahu's chatbot. Facebook complied reluctantly. Their argument, by the way, was that A, the removal of the poll from Messenger is impossible, technically, and B, that since I've already tweeted the poll, and that tweet was covered by the news media, um, there's no point in removing it. Uh, nevertheless, they had to do it, and they suspended Netanyahu's chatbot on election day for three critical hours, and this was Netanyahu's most critical tool for mobilizing uh, supporters. As you can see, Netanyahu was furious. <laughs> this was the first and probably the last time Facebook intervened in a head of state's Facebook asset on election day. It is with this counter archive, with this very low quality, low tech screenshot, that we held both Facebook and Netanyahu accountable to political manipulation and intervened in real time. And this personal example leads me to conclude the talk by discussing counter archive as a moral imperative and its limits. Since memory institutions, such as real libraries and archives, or the Internet Archive, are unable to reclaim the role of archons as archons of public digital media after datafication, it is the role of social media researchers who are already committed to research ethics and to respecting users' privacy to cross disciplinary boundaries and engage in archival work through building counter archives and making them available for public scrutiny. For without such scholarly intervention, and should researchers resort only to uh, post-API methods that are useful for immediate use, the implication of platform lockout might be the dehistorization and subsequently the depolitization of social media research and a growing dependence on Facebook's self-assumed role as the contemporary archon of public data. Now, critics of the approach may argue that instead of a method, what is being proposed is a form of civic engagement and political action. Indeed, the question of legitimacy is raised when establishing collections that are not only intended for individual use. Compared to API-based research, the need to build collections that are public-facing puts additional burden on researchers' shoulders. Since institutional archives cannot build agonistic archives, individual researchers are now burdened with both the archivists and the activists' tasks. It is the role of scholars to not only take responsibility on the ethics of data extraction and sharing, but also on the accessibility, transparency, and sustainability of their collections. So I hope that I've been able to convince you to start building your own counter archives and make them available for others to use. Thank you.